Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. Today is our 88th program, and I hope you've listened to all of them. <laughs> I'm going to start with two words today that have set me uh, thinking this past week. They are taking stock, taking stock. Don't use them so often anymore, but let me tell you the story behind why I've been musing on those two words. I once met a man, sounds like a joke, doesn't it? Actually last week in a Camden coffee shop, a man I learned as time and chat unfolded, who is on a solo three week journey along the mid coast from his work and his home in the busy, quote, most often frantic and stressful, his words, financial district of Boston. Now, as casual conversations go among us of a certain age, even strangers, we landed on the topic of retirement. I, a part of that big mid-coast population for four years now, and he about to make the move at the end of the year. What's it like? What do you spend your time thinking about? Heavy conversation for a coffee shop, eh? <laughs> he asked as he was comparing notes from a wide variety of new casual acquaintances along the way, casually. He is determined to retire completely from his busy mind and time consuming career, cold turkey, he said. None of this overseeing operations once a week, none of this quarterly consulting, none of this only an email away, maybe even move to a stark hut on the outskirts of Reykjavik if that's what it takes. In his personal processing and planning, he said he was carefully taking stock. Taking stock, I quite liked the term. He's weighing the details in chapters of his life, he said, um, the decisions made, the actions taken, the roads not taken, to quote Robert Frost. Now, as I scanned my own processing mind with half of my attention, I continued to listen to the exploratory thoughts of this stranger who claimed that the opinions of family members and friends were biased. He wanted the wisdom of strangers. Taking stock of one's life. Hmm. Valuable food for thought. I thought. Wisely, he wasn't adding up, subtracting, too late wishing, or the very worst, regretting. We were rambling, taking stock of friends, past and present, came into the conversation. I'm glad I didn't go to the Vietnam War. This said with sure conviction out of the clear blue sky, but tinged with what struck me as a new sense of sadness. We were of the same generation. I really wanted to go with my friends, he said. Flat feet stopped him. I lost the best friends of my life. Then I went into mind pause for only briefly, but to put the conversation on hold for myself, taking stock. Today's long scheduled featured novel is about friendship and loss and war. The Iraq War. 2004 to 2005 in this book. 
The Yellow Birds by Kevin Powers, published in 2012, is about two promising young men, 18 and 21, who find themselves in a world unknown, a world beyond imagination, a world far, far from the Blue Ridge Mountains and a world testing every sinew of their body and their minds in order to stay alive and to fulfill a promise, the fallout from which is devastating for everyone. Boys, families, the military, and most important, of the men they become. The Los Angeles Times states, the Yellow Birds might just be the first American literary masterpiece produced by the Iraq War. But before exploring the story told, let's consider some facts about the author, Kevin Powers. Kevin Powers lived through much of the journey of the Yellow Birds. His sharing of the harrowing experiences in a modern American war in a far off land of nothing recognizable and everything beyond eye opening is not totally biographical, but it's darn close to it. Following formative years with his family in Richmond, Virginia, Powers enlisted in the U.S. Army at the young age of 17. In 2004 and 5, he served a one-year deployment as a machine gunner in Tel Afar, the setting of the book, and in Mosul, another town we know ever so well. After his honorable discharge, he enrolled at Virginia Commonwealth University and secured a bachelor's degree in English. He then continued on to obtain his Master of Fine Arts degree as a Michener Fellow in Poetry at the University of Texas in Austin. In addition to this, his first novel, Powers has gone on to craft a book of poetry in 2014 called Letters composed during a lull in the fighting. And a second novel, A Shout in the Ruins, published in 2018. Ron Charles of the Washington Post wrote of Powers and his book in 2012 as a novel of grit, grace, and blood by the Iraq War veteran. Kevin Powers is that veteran and that writer. The Yellow Birds, published in 2012, is Powers' first novel, and it has been called by the New York Times a classic of contemporary war fiction. Extraordinary, they continue to say, a harrowing story about the friendship of two young men trying to stay alive on the battlefield, brilliantly observed and deeply affecting. Mikiko Kukatani, book credit for the New York Times, subsequently wrote, at once a freshly imagination, imagined coming of age, Bildungsgromen a metaphysical parable about the loss of innocence and the uses of memory, a coming of age story. The novel will stand with Tim O'Brien's enduring Vietnam book, The Things That Carried, as a classic of contemporary war fiction. In an interview, Powers explained in the Guardian newspaper why he wrote the book, quote, one of the reasons why I wrote the book was the idea that people kept saying, what was it like over there? 
it seemed that it was not an information-based problem. There was a good deal of information around, but what people really wanted was to know what it felt like physically, emotionally, and psychologically. So that's why I wrote the book. Asked about the best book of 2012, writer David Eggers said this to the observer, there are a bunch of books I could mention, but the book I find myself pushing on people more than any other is The Yellow Birds by Kevin Powers. The author fought in Iraq with the US Army and then many years later, this gorgeous novel emerged. Next to The Forever War by Dexter Filkins, it's the best thing I've read about the war in Iraq and by far the best novel. Powers is a poet first. So the book is spare, incredibly precise, unimprovable. The Yellow Birds, his first novel garnered these kudos and awards in 2012 and 2013. It was the winner of the Hemingway Foundation Penn Award. So very prestigious. It was also the witty winner of the Guardian First Book Award. It was a co-winner for the Annisfield Wolf Book Award, finalist for the National Book Award, and on the shortlist for the Flaherty Dunham First Novel Prize. The book was adapted on screen in 2017 for a film of the same title, directed by Alexandra Moores and starring Jack Houston, Alden Ehrenreich, Ty Sheridan, and Jennifer Aniston. An overall note before I begin reading, the reading experience for me aligned word for word with this comment from author Barbara Kingsolver. The Yellow Birds is one of those books that knocks your perceptions into new alignment permanently. And from famed author Hilary Mantel, who has called the book a masterpiece of war literature and a classic. Hmm. Big buildup for a book of only 259 pages. Precise is an accurate word. I begin today, uh, before the story starts, with an explanation for all of us of the title, The Yellow Bird. Uh, it is a traditional U.S. Army marching cadence. Perhaps you may know it. And it goes like this. A yellow bird with a yellow tail was perched upon my windowsill. I lured him in with a piece of bread and then I smashed his effing head. particularly pleasant uh, marching cadence, but I think it's very important to the book. The book alternates chapters. Uh, we start the book in Al-Tafar, which is in the Neva province of Iraq, uh, but it alternates back and forth between there and the United States. So chapter two, which we'll also read, brings us to Fort Dix, where of course the two men met, the two friends of the book. It then goes off to Germany, Rhineland, Germany, uh, for processing before going on to Iraq. And then the remaining chapters do continue to go back and forth between the experience in Al-Tafar and memories, uh, et cetera, back in, Richmond, Virginia, and the Blue Ridge Mountains. So it has a particular structure to the story. I'm going to start with chapter one and, and uh, go on to chapter two. We're going to stay with those two today. Uh, chapter one does begin in September 2004, 
which coincidentally is exactly the time that Mr. Powers began his assignment. So, The Yellow Birds by Kevin Powers. The war tried to kill us in the spring as grass greened at the plains of Nineveh and the weather warmed, we patrolled the low slung hills beyond the cities and towns. We moved over them and through the tall grass on faith, needing paths into the windswept growth like pioneers. While we slept, the war rubbed its thousand ribs against the ground in prayer. When we pressed onward through exhaustion, its eyes were white and open in the dark. While we ate, the war fasted, fed by its own deprivation. It made love and gave birth and spread through fire. Then in summer, the war tried to kill us as the heat blanched all color from the plains. The sun pressed into our skin and the war sent its citizens rustling into the shade of white buildings. It cast a white shade on everything like a veil over our eyes. It tried to kill us every day, but it had not succeeded. Not that our safety was preordained. We were not destined to survive. The fact is we were not destined at all. The war would take what it could get. It was patient. It didn't care about objectives or boundaries, whether you were loved by many or not at all. While I slept that summer, the war came to me in my dreams and showed me its sole purpose, to go on, only to go on. And I knew the war would have its way. The war had killed thousands by September. Their bodies lined the pocked avenues at irregular intervals. They were hidden in alleys, were found in bloating piles in the troughs of the hills outside the cities, the faces puffed and green, allergic now to life. The war had tried its best to kill us all, man, woman, child, but it had killed fewer than a thousand soldiers like me and Murph. Those numbers still meant something to us as what passed for fall began. Murph and I had agreed. We didn't want to be the thousandth killed. If we died later, then we died. But that, that number be someone else's milestone. We hardly noticed a change when September came, but I know now that everything will ever, ever matter in my life began then. Perhaps light came a little more slowly to the city of Altafa, falling the way it did beyond thin shapes of roof lines and angled promenades in the dark. It fell over buildings in the city, white and tan made of clay bricks roofed with corrugated metal or concrete. The sky was vast and catacombed with clouds. A cool wind blew down from the distant hillsides we'd been patrolling all year. It passed over the minarets that rose above the citadel flowed down through alleys with their flapping green awnings, out over the bare fields that ringed the city, and finally broke up against the scattered dwellings from which our rifles bristled. Our platoon moved around our rooftop position, gray streaks against the pre-dawn light. It was still late summer then, a Sunday, I think. We waited. For four days, we had crawled along the rooftop grid. We slipped and slid on a carpeting of loose brass casings left over from the previous day's fighting. We curled ourselves into absurd shapes and huddled below the whitewashed walls of our position. We stayed awake on amphetamines and fear. 
I pushed my chest off the rooftop and crested the low wall, trying to scan the few acres of the world for which we were responsible. The squat buildings beyond the field undulated through the tinny green of my scope. Bodies were scattered about from the past four days of fighting in the open space between our positions and the rest of Al-Tafar. They lay in the dust, broken and shattered and bent, their white ships gone dark with blood. A few smoldered among the junipers and spare tufts of grass, and there was a heady mix of carbon and bolt oil and their bodies burning in the newly crisp air of morning. I turned around, ducked back below the wall and lit a cigarette, shielding the cherry in my curled palm. I pulled long drags off it and blew the smoke against the top of the roof where it spread out and then rose and disappeared. The ash grew long and hung there and a very long time seemed to pass before it fell to the ground. The rest of the platoon on the roof started to move and jostle with the flickering half light of dawn. Sterling perched with his rifle over the wall, sleeping and starting throughout our waiting. He jerked his head back occasionally and swiveled to see if anyone had caught him. He showed me a broad disheveled grin in the receding dark, held up his trigger finger and dawbled. Tabasco sauce into his eyes to stay awake. He turned back toward our sector and his muscles visibly bucked and tensed beneath his gear. Murph's breath was a steady comfort to my right. I had grown accustomed to it, the way he'd punctuate his rhythm with a well-practiced spit into an acrid pool of dark liquid that always seemed to be growing between us. He, seemed, he smiled up at me. Want a rub, Bart? I nodded. He passed me a can of care package Kodiak and I jammed it into the cup of my bottom lip, snubbing out my cigarette. The wet tobacco bit and made my eyes water. I spat into the pool between us. I was awake. Out of the gray early morning, the city became whole. White flags hung in a few scattered windows in the buildings beyond the bodies in the field. They formed an odd crochet where the window's dark recesses were framed by jagged glass. The windows themselves were set into whitewashed buildings that became even brighter in the sun. A thin fog off the Tigris dissipated, revealing what hints of life remained. And in the soft breeze from the hills to the north, the white rags of truce fluttered above those same green awnings. Sterling tapped at the face of his watch. We knew the Muzin's song would soon warble at eerie fabric of minor notes out from the minarets, calling the faithful to prayer. It was a sign and we knew what it meant, that hours had passed, that we had drawn nearer to our purpose, which was as vague and foreign as the indistinguishable dawns and dusks with which it came. On your toes, guys, the lieutenant called in a forceful whisper. Murph sat up and calmly worked a small dot of lubricant into the action of his rifle. He chambered around and rested the barrel against the low wall. He stared off into the gray angles where the streets and alleys opened to the field to our front. I could see into his blue eyes the whites spider webbed with red. They had fallen farther into his sockets during the past few months. There were times when I looked at him and could only see two small shadows, two empty holes. I let the bolt push around into the chamber of my rifle and nodded at him. Here we go again, I said. He smiled from the corner of his mouth. Same old crap again, he answered. We'd come to that building as the moon flagged to a sliver in the first hours of the battle. There were no lights on. We crashed our vehicle through a flimsy metal gate 
that had once been painted dark red, but it's since rusted over, so that it was hard to tell what part had been painted red and what part was rust. When the map dropped from our vehicle, we rushed to the door. A few soldiers from first squad rushed to the back and the rest of the platoon attacked up at the front. We kicked in both doors at the same time and ran in. The building was empty. As we went through each room, the lights affixed to the front of our rifles cut narrow cylinders through the dark interior, but they were not bright enough to see by. The lights showed the dust we'd kicked up. Chairs had been turned over in some of the rooms and colorfully woven rugs hung over the window sills where the glass had been shot out. There were no people. In some of the rooms, we thought we saw people and we yelled out sharply for the people who were not there to get on the floor. We went through each room like that until we got to the roof. When we got to the roof, we looked out over the field. The field was flat and made of dust and the city was dark behind it. At daybreak on the first day, our interpreter Malik came into the flat concrete roof and sat next to me where I leaned against a wall. It was not yet light, but it almost appeared to be because the sky was white the way the sky is when heavy with snow. We heard fighting across the city, but it had not reached us yet. Only the noise of rockets and machine guns and helicopters swooping down near vertical in the distance told us we were in a war. This is my old neighborhood, he told me. His English was exceptional. There was a glottal sound in his voice, but it was not harsh. I'd often asked him to help me with my sparse Arabic, trying to get my pronunciation of this or that word right. Shukran, Afwan, Quimbola. Thank you, you're welcome, bomb. He'd help, but he always ended our exchanges by saying, my friend, I need to speak English for the practice. He'd been a student at the university before the war studying literature. When the university closed, he came to us. He wore a hood over his face, wore khaki slacks and a faded dress shirt that appeared to be ironed freshly every day. He never took his mask off. The one time Murph and I had asked him about it, he took his index finger and traced the fringe of the hood that hung around his neck. They'll kill me for helping you. They'll kill my whole family. Murph hunched low and trotted over the other side of the roof where he had been helping the lieutenant and Sterling set up the machine gun after we'd arrived. Watching him move, I got the impression that the flatness of the desert made him nervous that somehow the low ridge lines in the distance made the dried brown grasses of the floodplain even more unbearable. Hey Murph, I said, this is Malik's old stomping grounds. Murph ducked quickly and sat next to the wall. Whereabouts, he asked. Malik told him and pointed to a strip of buildings that seemed to grow organically in odd, not quite 90 degree sections. The building stood beyond the field at the beginning of our sector. A little farther past the outskirts of Altafar, there was an orchard. Fires burned from steel drums and trash heaps and sprung up seemingly without cause around the edges of the city. Murph and I did not stand up, but we saw where Malik pointed. Mrs. Al-Sharifi used to plant her hyacinth in this field. He spread his hands out wide and moved his arms in a sweeping motion that reminded me of convocation. Murph reached for the cuff of Malik's pressed shirt. Careful, big guy, you're gonna get silhouetted. She was this crazy old widow. He had his hands on his hips. His eyes were glazed over with exhaustion. The women in the neighborhood were so jealous of those flowers, Malik laughed. They accused her of using magic to make them grow the way they did. He had paused then and put his hands on the dried mud wall we'd been leaning against. They were burned up in the battle last fall. She did not try to replant them this year, he finished brusquely. I tried to imagine living there, but could not. 
even though we had patrolled the same streets Malik was talking about and drank tea in the small clay hovels. And I had had my hands wrapped in the thinly veined hands of the old men and women who lived in them. All right, buddy, I said, you're gonna get your butt shot off if you don't sit down. It's a shame. And uh, I don't see those hyacinths, he said. And then it started. It seemed as if the movement of one moment to the next had had its own trajectory, a thing both finite and expensive, like the endless divisibility of numbers strung out on a line. The tracers reached out from all the dark spaces in the buildings across the field, and there were more bullets than streaks of phosphorescence. We heard them tear at the air around our ears and smack into the clay brick and concrete. We did not see Malik get killed, but Murph and I had his blood on both of our uniforms. When we got the order to cease fire, we looked over the low wall and he was lying in the dust and there was a lot of blood around him. Doesn't count, does it? Murph said. No, I don't think so. Where, where we're at, 968, 970, we'll have to check the paper when we get back. I was not surprised by the cruelty of my ambivalence then. Nothing seemed more natural than someone getting killed. And now as I reflect on how I felt and behaved as a boy of 21, from my position of safety in a warm cabin above a clear stream in the Blue Ridge, I can only tell myself that it was necessary. I needed to continue and to continue, I had to see the world with clear eyes to focus on the essential. We only pay attention to rare things and death was not rare. Rare was the bullet with your name on it. The IED buried just for you. Those were the things we watched for. I didn't think about Malik much after that. He was an incidental figure who only seemed to exist in his relation to my continuing life. I couldn't have articulated it then, but I'd been trained to think war was the great unifier. That it brought people closer together than any other activity on earth. Crap. War is the great maker of solipsists. How are you going to save my life today? Dying would be one way. If you die, it becomes more than likely that I will not. You're nothing. That's the secret. A uniform in a sea of numbers, a number in a sea of dust. And we somehow thought those numbers were a sign of our own insignificance. We thought that if we remained ordinary, we would not die. We confused correlation with cause and saw a special significance in the portraits of the dead arranged neatly next to the number corresponding to their place on the growing list of casualties we read in the newspapers as indications of an ordered war. We had a sense, something we only felt in the brief flash of synapse to synapse, that these names had been on the list long before the dead had come to Iraq, that the names were there as soon as those portraits had been taken, a number given, a place assigned, and that they'd been dead from that moment forward. When we saw the name Sergeant Ezekiel Vazquez, 21, Laredo, Texas, number 748, killed by a small arms fire in Biquaba, Iraq, we were sure that he'd walked as a ghost for years through South Texas. We thought that he was already dead on the flight over, that he was, if he was scared when the C-141 bringing him to Iraq had pitched and yawed through the sky above Baghdad, there had been no need. He had nothing to fear. He'd been invincible, absolutely, until the day he was not. The same too for specialist Miriam Jackson, 19, Trenton, New Jersey, number 914, 
dead as a result of wounds sustained in a mortar attack in Samara at Landstruhl Regional Medical Center. We were glad, not that she was killed, only that we were not. We hoped that she'd been happy, that she took advantage of her special status before she inevitably arrived under the falling mortar, having gone out to hang her freshly washed uniform on a line behind her connex. Of course, we were wrong. Our biggest error was thinking that it mattered what we thought. It seems absurd now that we saw each death as an affirmation of our lives, that each one of those deaths belonged to a time and that therefore that time was not ours. We didn't know the list was limitless. We didn't think beyond a thousand. We never considered that we could be among the walking dead as well. I used to think that maybe living under the contradiction had guided my actions and that one decision made or unmade in adherence to this philosophy could have put me on or kept me off the list of the dead. I know it isn't like that now. There were no bullets with my name on them or with Murphs for that matter. There were no bombs made just for us. Any of them would have killed us just as well as they'd killed the owners of those names. We didn't have a time laid out for us or a place. I've stopped wondering about those inches to the left and right of my head. The three miles an hour difference that would have put us directly over an IED. It never happened. I didn't die. Murph did. And though I wasn't there when it happened, I believe unswervingly that when Murph was killed, the dirty knives that stabbed him were addressed to whom it may concern. Nothing made us special, not living, not dying, not even being ordinary. Still, I like to think there was a ghost of compassion in me then, and that if I had had a chance to see those hyacinths, I would have noticed them. Malik's body, crumbled and broken at the foot of the building, didn't shock me. Murph passed me a smoke and we lay down beneath the wall again, but I could not stop thinking about a woman Malik's conversation had reminded me of, who had served us tea in small, finely blemished cups. The memory seemed impossibly distant, buried in the dust, waiting for some brush to uncover it. I remembered how she blushed and smiled and how impossible it was for her to not be beautiful, despite her age, a paunch, a few teeth gone brown, and her skin appearing like the cracked dry clay of summer. Perhaps this is how it was, a field full of hyacinth. It was not like that when we stormed the building, not like that four days after Malik died. The green grasses that waved in the breeze were burned by fire in the summer sun. The festival of people on the market street with their long white ships and loud voices were gone. Some of them were lying dead in the courtyards of the city or in its lace of alleys. The rest walked or rode in sluggish caravans on foot or in orange and white jalopies, in mule-drawn carts or in huddled groups of twos and threes, women and men, the old and young, the whole and wounded. All that was the life of al Tafa left in a drab parade out of the city. They walked past our gates, past Jersey walls and gun emplacements, out into the dry September hills. They did not raise their eyes in the curfewed hours. They were a speckled line of color in the dark and they were leaving. 
A radio crackled in the rooms beneath us. The lieutenant quietly gave our situation report to our command. Yes, sir, he said. Roger, sir. And it passed at each level more removed from us until I am sure somewhere someone was told in a room that was warm and dry and safe that 18 soldiers had watched the alleys and streets of Al Tafar through the night and that X number of enemies were lying dead in a dusty field. The day had almost broken over the city and the ridges in the desert where the low electric noise of the radio was replaced by the sound of the lieutenant's boots padding up the staircase to the roof. Mere outlines took shape and the city, vague and notional at night, became a contoured and substantial thing before us. I looked west. Tans and greens emerged in the light. The gray of mud walls, the buildings and courtyards arranged in squat honeycombs receded with the rising sun. A few fires burned in the grove of thin and ordered fruit trees a little to the south. The smoke rose through a gently tattered canopy of leaves only slightly taller than a man and leaned obedient to the wind coming across the valley. The lieutenant came up to the roof and lowered himself into a slouch his upper body parallel to the earth, his legs chugging until he reached the wall. He sat with his back against the wall and gestured for us to gather around him. All right, guys, this is the deal. Murphy and I leaned against each other until the weight of our bodies found their balance. Sterling inched closer to the lieutenant and fixed his eyes in a hard glare that traversed the rest of us on the roof. Before he continued, he let out a short, bright sigh and rubbed a rash the color of washed out raspberries with two fingers. It covered a small oval from his sharp brow line down into his left cheek and seemed to follow the rounded path of his eye socket. The Lieutenant was a distant person by nature. I don't even remember where he was from. There was something restrained about him, something more than simple adherence to non-fraternization. It was not elitism. He seemed to be unknowable or slightly adrift. He sighed often. We're here until midday or so, he said. Third platoon is going to push through the alleys in our northwest and try to flush them to our front. Hopefully they'll be too scared to do much shooting at us before we... He paused and brought his hand down from his face, reached into the pocket of his chest beneath his body armor and fished for a cigarette. I handed him one. Thanks, Bottle, he said. He turned to look at the orchard burning to the south. How long have those fires been going? Probably started last night, said Murph. Okay, you and Bottle keep an eye on that. The column of smoke that bent beneath the wind had straightened. It cut a black, runny line across the sky. What was I saying before that? The lieutenant looked absently over his shoulder and inched his eye up over the wall. A specialist from second squad said, hey, no sweat, lieutenant, we got it. Sterling cut him off. Shut up, lieutenant's done when he says he's done. I didn't realize it then, but Sterling seemed to know exactly how hard to push the lieutenant so that discipline remained. He didn't care if we hated him. He knew what was necessary. He smiled at me and his straight white teeth reflected the early morning sun. You were saying, sir, that hopefully they'll be too scared to shoot before the lieutenant opened his mouth to finish his thought, but Sterling continued, before we kill, the Haji. The lieutenant nodded his head and slouched over and trotted downwards. He crawled back to our positions to wait. A fire had begun to burn in the town, its source obscured by walls and alleys. Thick black smoke seemed to join from a hundred fires all over Al Tafar, becoming one long curl toward heaven. <clears throat> The sun gathered itself behind us, rising in the east, warming the collar of my blouse, baking in the salt that clotted in hard lines and snaked around our necks and arms. I turned my head and looked right into it. 
I had to close my eyes, but I could still see its shape, a white hole in the darkness before I turned west again and opened them. Two minarets rose like arms up from the dusty buildings, slightly obscured now and then by smoke. They were dormant. No sound had come from them that morning. No Adhan had been called. The long line of refugees that snaked its way out of the city for the past four days had slowed. Only a few old men bent over worn canes and cedar shuffled between the field of dead and the grove of trees. Two gaunt dogs bounced around them, nipped their heels, retreated when struck, and then started in on them again. And it began once more. The orchestral whine of falling mortars arrived from all around us. Even after so many months behind them, beneath them, there was a blank confusion on the faces of the platoon. We stared at one another with mouths agape, fingers strangling the grips of our rifles. It was clear dawn in September in Al-Tafar, and the war seemed narrowly focused, as if it occurred only in this place, and I remember feeling like I had jumped into a cold river on the first warm day of spring, wet and scarred and breathing hard with nothing to do but swim. Incoming! We moved by root. Our bodies made prostrate, our fingers interlaced between our heads, our mouths open to keep the pressure balanced. And then the sound of the impacts echoed off into the morning. I didn't raise my head until the last reverberation faded. I looked over the wall slowly and a din of voices shouted, all clear, and I'm up. Bartle, Murph huffed, I'm up, I'm up. I said quietly, and I was breathing very hard, and I looked out over the field, and there were wounds in the earth and in the already dead and battered bodies, and a few small juniper trees were turned up and on their sides where the mortars fell. Sterling ran to the opening in the floor and yelled down to the lieutenant, up, sir. He moved to each one of us on the roof, smacking the back of our helmets. Get ready, he said. I hated him. I hated the way he excelled in death and brutality and domination. But more than that, I hated the way he was necessary, how I needed him to jar me into action even when they were trying to kill me, how I felt like a coward until he screamed into my ear, shoot those haji. I hated the way I loved him when I inched up out of the terror and returning fire, seeing him shooting too, smiling the whole time, screaming the whole rage and hate of these few acres alive and spreading in and through him. And they did come, shadowed in windows. They came out from behind woven prayer rugs and fired a burst and the bullets whipped past and we'd duck and listen as they smacked against the concrete and mud brick and little pieces flew in every direction. They ran through trash-strewn alleys, past burning drums and plastic blowing like clumps of thistle over the ancient cobblestones. Sterling yelled a long time that day before I squeezed the trigger. My ears had already rung out from the noise and the first bullet I released into the field seemed to leave my rifle with a dull pop. It kicked up a little cloud of dust when it hit and it was surrounded by many other little clouds of dust just like it. Browns by the hundreds shook dust off the ground, the trees and buildings. An old car crumpled and collapsed beneath the dust. Once in a while, someone ran between the buildings, behind the orange and white cars, over the rooftops, and they'd surround themselves with little clouds of dust. A man ran behind a low wall in a courtyard and looked around, astonished to be alive, his weapon cradled in his arms. My first instinct was to yell out at him, you made it, buddy, keep going. But I remembered how odd it would be to say a thing like that. It was not long before the others saw him too. He looked left, then right, and the dust popped around him. And I wanted to tell everyone to stop shooting at him, to ask what kind of men are we? An old sensation came over me as if I'd been saved, for I was not a man, but a boy. 
but that he may have been frightened, but I didn't mind that so much because I was frightened too. And I realized with a great shock that I was shooting at him and that I wouldn't stop until I was sure that he was dead. And I felt better knowing we were killing him together and that it was just as well not to be sure you are the one who did it. But I knew I shot him and he slumped over behind the wall. He was shot again by someone else. The bullet went through his chest and ricocheted, breaking a potted plant hanging from a window above the courtyard. Then he was shot again and he fell at a strange angle, angle backward over his bent legs. And most of the side of his face was gone and there was a lot of blood and it pooled around him in the dust. A car drove toward us along the road between the orchard and the field of dead. Two large white sheets billowed from its rear windows. Sterling ran to the other side of the building where the machine run was set up. I looked through my scope and saw an old man behind the wheel and an elderly woman in the back passenger seat. Sterling laughed. Come on. He couldn't see them. I'll yell, I thought. I'll tell them they're old, let them pass but bullets bit at the crumbling road around the car they punched into the sheet metal. I said nothing. I followed the car with my scope. The old woman ran her fingers along a string of pale beads. Her eyes were closed. I couldn't breathe. The car stopped in the middle of the road, but Sterling did not stop the shooting. The bullets ripped through the car and out the other side. The holes in the car funneled light and the smoke and dust hung in the light. The door opened and she fell from the old car. She tried to drag herself to the side of the road. She crawled, her old blood mixed with the ash and dust. She stopped moving. Whew. Holy crap. That one got murdered, Murph said. There was no grief or anguish or joy or pity in that statement. There was no judgment made. He was just surprised, like he was waking from a long afternoon nap, disoriented, realizing that the world has continued uninterrupted in spite of the strange things that may have happened while you slept. He could have said that it was Sunday, as we did not know what day it was, and it would have been a sudden thing to notice that it was Sunday at a time like that, but he spoke the truth either way, and it wouldn't have mattered much if he had been Sunday, and since none of us had slept in a long time, none of it really seemed to matter much at all. Sterling sat down beneath the wall next to the machine gun. He waved us to him and took a piece of pound cake from his cargo pocket on his trousers as we listened to the final bursts of nervous firing peter out. He broke the dry cake into three pieces. Take this, he said, eat. The smoke rose and began to disappear. I watched the old woman bleed on the side of the road. The dust blew in languid waves and began to swirl slightly. We heard shots again. Beyond the building, a small girl with auburn curls and a tattered sundress stepped out toward the old woman. Errant bullets from other positions kicked up the dust around her in dry blooms. We looked to Sterling. He waved us off. Someone get on the net and tell them it's just a kid, he said. The girl ducked behind the building, then emerged again, this time shuffling toward the old woman very slowly. She tried dragging the body and her face contorted with effort as she pulled the old woman by her one complete arm. The girl described circles into the fine dust as she paced around the body. The, bat, the path they made was marked in blood. From the car smoking and ablaze, through a courtyard ringed by hyacinths to the place where the woman lay dead, attended by a small child who rocked and moved her lips, perhaps singing some desert elegy that I couldn't hear. The ash from the burning of clay bricks and the fat off lean men and women covered everything. The pale minarets dominated the smoke and the sky was still pale like snow. The city seemed to reach upward out of the settling dust our part was over for a while at last. It was September, and though there were few trees from which leaves could fall, some did. They shook off the scattered and sl slender branches, buffeted by the wind and light descending from the hills to the north. I tried to count the leaves as they fell, removed from their moorings by the impact of mortars and bombs. 
They shook. A thin sheaf of dust floated off each one. I looked at Murph and Sterling and the rest of the platoon on the roof. The lieutenant walked to each of us and put his hand on our arms, speaking softly, trying to soothe us with the sound of his voice the way one would with frightened horses. Perhaps our eyes were wet and black. Perhaps we barred our teeth, bared our teeth. Good job, and you're okay. And we're gonna be okay, he said. It was hard to believe that we'd be okay and that we'd fought well, but I remember being told that the truth does not depend on being believed. The radio came again. Before long, the lieutenant would give us another mission. He would be tired when the mission came, but we would go for we had no alternative. Perhaps we had had them once, alternatives, other paths to take. But our course was certain then, if unknown. It was going to be dark before we knew it. We had lived, Murph and me. I try so hard now to remember if I saw any hint of what was coming. If there was some shadow over him, some way I could have known he was so close to being killed. In my memory of those days on the rooftop, he is half a ghost, but I didn't see it then and couldn't. No one can see that. I guess I'm glad I didn't know because we were happy that morning in Al Tafar in September. Our relief was coming. The day was full of light and warm. We slept. And let's go to chapter two, a briefer chapter taking place in December of 2003. Remember that chapter one was September 2004. We're at Fort Dix, New Jersey, where of course everyone starts their journey. Mrs. LaDonna Murphy, rural mail carrier, would have only needed to read the first word of the letter to know that it had not been written by her son. The truth is she had not received all that many letters from him. So when I wrote it, I took a guess that she might not have much to compare it to. He'd rarely been more than a few miles away from her during the first 17 years of his life. About five miles, depending on where Daniel was. When we reached the farthest stop on her mail route, it measured as the crow flies. Seven, if we allow for depth at midnight. During those three months, he walked in the Ship Mountain Mine after he graduated from the Bluefield Vocational and Technical School. Then on to Fort Benning in the fall, the farthest he had ever been from home where Daniel would write her a few short notes before lights out, scrawling out his thoughts about the redness of the clay, the pleasure he took in sleeping under those endless Georgia stars. And when time allowed, making space for the assurances that boys like me and Daniel always end up sending to our families, assurances that were as much for us as for them. The rest of his life, he had spent with me 10 months, give or take, from the time he appeared next to me in formation that day in New Jersey, with the snow so high over our boots that our left and right faces made only a whisper in the snow. 10 months, give or take, from that day to the day he died. It might seem like a short time, but my whole life since has merely been a digression from those days, which now hang over me like a quarrel that will never be resolved. I'd had this idea once that you had to grow old before you died. I still feel like there is some truth to it because Daniel Murphy had grown old in the 10 months I'd known him. And perhaps it was a need for something to make sense that caused me to pick up a pencil and write a letter to a dead boy's mother, to write it in his name. Having known him plenty long enough 
to know it was not his way to call his mother mom. I'd known a lot, really. I'd know that snow comes early in the year in the mountains where Daniel was from, November, sure, and sometimes as early as October. But I only found out later that she'd read that letter with snow falling all around her, that she'd set it on the seat next to her while she mushed her old right-hand drive Jeep up and down the switchbacks on her route, carving clean tracks through the white erasure that had fallen all throughout the night before. And that is she pulled down the long gravel path leading to their little house on the winter dormant apple orchard Daniel had talked about so often. She kept sneaking glances at the return address. She must have taken those glances with an unusual level of skepticism for a rural mail carrier as experienced as she was because she thought each time that something different would be written there. When the wheels of her old Jeep finally stopped and the whole mass of 80, 1984 metal slid a few last feet in the snow, she'd taken the letter in both hands and become briefly, terrifyingly happy. At one more point, you could have asked me if I thought the snow meant anything and I would have said yes. I might have thought there was some significance to the fact that there had been snow on the day Murph had come into my life and snow on the day I willed myself into the one that had been taken from him. I may not have believed it, but I'm sure I would have wanted to. It's like lovely to think that snow can be special. We're always told it is of all those million, million, million flakes that fall. No two are alike forever and ever. Amen. I'd spent some time looking out the window in my cabin watching snowflakes fall like a shot dove's feathers fluttering slowly down to the ground. They all looked the same to me. I know it was a terrible thing to write that letter. What I don't know is where it fits in with all the other terrible things I think about. At some point along the way, I stopped believing in significance. Order became an accident of obstruction. I'd come to accept that parts of life are constant, that just because something happens on two different days doesn't make it a damn miracle. All I really know for sure is that no matter how long I live, and no matter how I spend that time, those scales aren't ever coming level. Murph's always going to be 18, and he's always going to be dead, and I'll be living with a promise that I couldn't keep. Well, I realize it's not so uplifting a book, but we must be reminded. We must be reminded of the damages of war. The letter, and especially the promise that the narrator makes to Murph's mother, that he will take care of him and bring him home, is really the crux of the book from there on. And the tremendous guilt that results. It's a beautifully written book. I think it's very easy to see that the man is a poet. He writes as a poet. His choice of words is poetic. It's, uh, it's just beautiful writing, precise, short sentences. Um, so I strongly recommend it. I realize it's not a book for all tastes, but I think it's probably the most beautiful book you could possibly read about the guts of war. The Yellow Birds, a national bestseller, National Book Award finalist, Kevin Powers, and the New York Times, deeply affecting. I suggest you read it if you have the time and the interest. Let me pause before finishing to tell you about next week's book. Uh, we'll go a bit lighter next week, <laughs> we'll alternate. <laughs> We're going to go to a book that was made into a film that everybody loved, me particularly because I'm a huge fan 
of Juliette Binoche, the fabulous French actor. Some of you are a fan also of the man who played opposite her, who was in the news so much in the last year. Even before it was adapted into the Oscar-nominated film starring Juliette Binoche and Johnny Depp, Joanne Harris's New York Times best-selling novel, Chocolat, entranced readers with its mix of hedonism, whimsy, and of course, chocolate. In tiny Langstenay, where nothing much has changed as a hundred years, beautiful newcomer Viviane Rocher and her exquisite chocolate shop arrive and instantly begin to play havoc with Lenten vows. Each box of luscious bonbons comes with a free gift. Vivian's uncanny perception of its buyer's private discontents and a clever, caring care for them. Is she a witch? Soon the parish no longer cares as it abandons itself to temptation, happiness, and a dramatic face-off between Easter solemnity and the pagan gaiety of a chocolate festival. Chocolat, every page offers a description of chocolate to melt in the mouths of chocoholics, francophiles, armchair gourmets, cookbook readers, and lovers of passion everywhere. It's a must for anyone who craves an escapist read, and it is a bewitching gift for any holiday. Please join me next week as we go to France and we go to Chocolat by Vivian Rocher. It's a marvelous book. It's part of the Viv Vivian Rocher series, actually, of novels. Uh, it was actually written by Joanne Harris. I'm sorry that I uh, mixed up a few names there. Anyway, Chocolat. Please join me next week and then you can watch the film. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching today on this very serious book reading. If you enjoyed the story, the video, please like it and consider sharing it with your friends. Also, please feel free to write a comment about the book, the author, the subject matter, war, your favorite book of any type that we may consider for reading on our program. I also encourage you to subscribe to the, Captain, uh, the Camden Public Library's program's YouTube channel to stay on top of all of the great content throughout the year. Thank you so much for joining me for today's reading. I hope there was something of value there. And I hope you'll join me next week for a bit of light, fluffy chocolate in the heart of France. Take care of yourself. Goodbye. <laughs>